35,000. I'm going to ask you to visualize that in terms of something tangible. For example, 35,000 cars stuck in a traffic jam, or 35,000 people in a single file. Now, 35,000 is the number of decisions, on average, an adult makes every single day. I read an article not so long ago which reported on that. And Cornell University actually added to that, saying, out of those 35,000, 226.7 decisions and choices are made to food and beverage every single day. Now, as we know, decisions can be made for a number of reasons, sometimes on, in, on impulse, sometimes through avoidance, like procrastination, sometimes through the process of prioritizing, reflecting, balancing, and weighing up the pros and cons. The article also, however, mentioned that every choice has consequences which are either good or bad. And when I read that, I asked myself, is that true? I don't believe in a bad decision because I've made, if you call it that, plenty of bad decisions in my life to date. But then again, I don't see them as bad decisions because every decision, good or bad, creates a learning moment. An expression in Thai language, which I love, it goes like this, pit pen cruel, which means the mistake becomes the teacher. And it's a very nice way of looking at making decisions which ultimately help you to, again, learn from your mistakes. In my youth, at age 14, I made one of the biggest decisions in my life, and that was to leave the very small village I was born and raised in. Now, I have very good memories of my youth, and I'm thankful especially to my mother for having raised me the way I did. But there was not much to do and not much to see. However, my youth was a little bit tainted by the fact that in the village, my dad was the mayor. And that kind of followed me around through my youth. And in one example, I remember when I was 13, I had gotten my first girlfriend. So after a couple of weeks of cycling to school together, holding hands and playing with each other's hair, and yes, <laughs> I did have hair back then, believe it or not, we plucked up the courage one Sunday night to find a very dark spot behind the local primary school, ready for our first proper embrace, and most importantly, our first real kiss. We were gonna have some fun. Well, that didn't last very long, because within five minutes, we were surrounded by a number of teenage boys who broke us up and chased me all the way home while shouting, we're going to tell your dad, the mayor, what we saw you do. And it was one of the most early humiliating experiences in my life. Didn't stop there, because my girlfriend the next day broke up with me and told everyone. The point is, I needed to get out of the village. So I learned at age 14 that listening to music was one way of developing my English, and that would be the key to me escaping from the village. It also made me become very passionate about English as a second language. Learning languages would be the key to finding my own identity by again leaving the village. I was very keen to find out what else was out there. And I knew that English was the key to that escape. Long story short, I got out, completed a hospitality college, and then for the next 15 years, I traveled the world in countries such as Germany, America, and England. Every time I went, I made a conscious choice to go by myself, which was both nerve-wracking and euphoric at the same time, because adrenaline would just be rushing through my body. I learned that every time I traveled, and challenge myself, a reward would be coming to me. 
in terms of learning new experiences, increasing my confidence levels, and most importantly, finding my true identity. If I briefly reflect on the 12 years I spent in London, one of the most amazing periods in my life to date. I remember when I first moved to London, one night I went to Piccadilly Circus, downtown London, and I was blown away by the sea of lights from these massive billboards which are on display at Piccadilly Circus, and I felt myself crying with poor, pure tears of joy, because here I was, no longer the mayor's son, living in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I want to take you back to the village, actually, if that's okay, for one last time. After I'd been living in London for a number of years, I went back to Holland on a holiday to visit my family and my friends. And on the way there, I bumped into the mother of one of my girlfriends. And she didn't know what had become of me. So she asked, Hans, where are you living now? And I breathed with pride saying, I live in London. And she looked at me sternly as she asked, why? I kind of snapped, I'm like, what do you mean, why? Next she said, Hans, what does London have that we don't have right here in the village? And I looked back at her thinking, is she for real? Made a very hasty retreat because I had no idea how to answer that question, how she could even ask that question. Anyway, back to London. I toured the world as a roadie for a band, a house and a rap band. I owned a restaurant in Battersea, south of the Thames. And the 15 years I spent in the hospitality industry have given me so much, and I learned so much. Yet, as I got older, it became tougher and tougher to always be working when other people were not working. Christmases, Easter's, every Friday, every Saturday. So two years before I hit 40, I asked myself, what else is out there? And more importantly, what else am I good at? Now, my British friends had said very nice things about the way my English had developed. And as I told you, I had become passionate about English, so I decided to go and do something with that. At this point, I'd rather not draw on about my life, so I'm going to cut a very long story short. Went back to university, qualified as an English teacher, studied some more, and then I saw a true epiphany coming over me. Because not only had I averted my midlife crisis, I could also very clearly now see my next path forward. To share my experiences through teaching, to positively impact the lives of others, and the communities of those living in them. I could also at the same time continue to travel to places to hopefully find a place which after London I could call my true second home. After 15 years, Thailand has become and continues to be that place. Teaching here in this country, it more often than not feels like stepping into a warm, relaxing bath. I have to tell you that when I first came here, I had to get used to the cultural differences between East and West, especially when we look at the classroom environment. Because in my view, students here are shaped so entirely differently than students in the West. I agree, part of the reason are the different cultural values, but I also believe quite strongly that this is partly attributed to the differences in educational systems. Teaching here, more often than not, to this day, remains very teacher-centered. So students are left devoid of critical thinking skills, communication skills, and very often, a complete lack of confidence. These young people are told from a very young age to never challenge their teachers because those teachers are older than them, and as such, they command automatic respect as the experienced voices of reason and authority. So my next challenge became teaching here, which I embraced wholeheartedly. 
Not only was I moving myself out of my comfort zone, this was my new mission, to push students out of their comfort zone, to help them and push them to speak up by telling them again and again and again that trying is better than not trying at all, that their accents are part of their personality. I may say university, they may say university. I may say working together, and again, they may say working together, but I love that. Because it shows not only the character, but also the enormous diversity of languages. I'm thankful, actually, to having become an educator later in life. Because by that time, I knew who I was, and because of that, I learned the true meaning of empathy. My teachers, when I was young, were all very competent, but there was not much empathy, and there was even less personal interest in the people behind the students. And I decided I was going to be someone different. Now, as you can see, I'm old enough to be their grandfather these days, but over the last 50 years, very close working relationships between the students and myself have remained, and it's something I cherish every single day. We see students in year one, they're trying to adjust to a new lifestyle, but at the same time, there's enormous pressure to deliver academically. But then we see them in year three, and we see the exponential growth with social skills, communication skills, as well as critical thinking skills, all in full bloom at the same time. Mark Twain once said, our opinions do not really come into fruition until we have expressed them to someone else. So yes, I love pushing students outside their comfort zone. Some of them don't like it, but in year three, a lot of them come back to me saying, look, Ajan, which means teacher in Thai, we now see what you did for us and we have seen the benefits. The younger generation in Thailand, right now, in this day and age, are driving the reform in this country by questioning the powers that be. The demonstrations in Bangkok over the last 12 months are an example of this because these huge demonstrations are driven by the younger generations, which I think is a spectacular development. Because 10 years ago, no one would have predicted that. These young people are not only chasing, but also realizing their dreams. When Sel Dylan and Nadisha asked me to speak today, something related to the theme stepping stones, I kind of sat down and I thought, well, how has teaching worked for me? So I would like to kind of share the following suggestions to, first of all, educators. Don't take yourself too seriously. Approach each student every single day with your own distinct sense of humor. I think it's okay to have a really good laugh in a classroom, personally. Push them outside their comfort zone. Because the formula for me has always been, every time I challenge myself and every time I help students challenge him or herself, it means an enormous sense of accomplishment is the reward. And again, it helps them to be part of maturing. And we as educators, I see it as my mission, need to facilitate that process. A bad grade does not mean it's a bad student. There has to be a reason behind that. Find out what it is. Embrace empathy. Extend a helping hand to help them to jump from one stepping stone onto another. I want to close with one final anecdote. At Stanford International University, we have students completing an internship in year three with unbelievably successful results. More often than not, they are offered a job on the spot even before they graduate. Yet, and this for me and many of my colleagues is the cherry on the cake, these same successful students are criticized often 
by their internship hosts. Why, I hear you ask. They tell us, your students are asking too many questions, or they are too focused on the solution. And we laugh here, because is that not exactly what all educators should be aiming for? I also want to share some suggestions to students and young people in general. You are in the process of maturing. Remember, every time you choose, you challenge yourself, and a true sense of accomplishment is your reward. Sure, maybe rejection will follow, but at this point in your life, is that really such a bad thing? If you think it is, why not Google rejection challenges? There are numerous activities you can do online, and you'll find that once you have chosen one, you do one and you complete one, you'll become stronger and more resilient in years to come. At this stage in your life, young people, you are preparing to jump from one stepping stone to another. The next one is just in front of you. All you have to do is jump onto it, and you may be surprised how much you can achieve. Like me, every time you push yourself, you are creating memories which will last you a lifetime. So go on, do it, you know you want to. Thank you.